rape. It's a word that gets stuck in my throat, and I think that it's meant to. I'm going to continue to use the word rape throughout this talk, because rape is a tough word to hear. And these are tough conversations to have. Tough conversations like this need to happen. Otherwise, there won't be any positive change in our future society. Rape affects not just the survivor, but everyone around them. What matters is how you were there for the survivor when they open up to you about their rape. It's never easy knowing what to say or how to act when a survivor tells you something that doesn't make any sense, like rape. However, if you are there for them by believing them and supporting them, you might help them keep going when they think they can't. The ugly truth is that rape is a traumatic event that leaves painful wounds in a survivor's life. I'm going to be vulnerable with all of you today. I'm going to tell you how my rape affected my life and my relationships. However, this is from my one perspective. I do not speak for all other survivors. Each survivor has their own story to tell, and this is my story about how my traumatic experiences changed my life. I was 18 when I was raped. It was my second semester of college. A group of friends and I went to a frat party where I met my rapist. He came up to us and used a pickup line from my favorite TV show, and he seemed really nice. So a group of us went to his house, and we hung out. And before I knew it, I was lying naked and traumatized in his bed after my friends had left, and I was somehow alone with him. I remember not being able to tell any of my friends that night what had happened because I was petrified that no one would believe me. And I felt ashamed and embarrassed. It is like I knew that something bad had happened, but I didn't know how to use such a knife-stabbing word, rape. I couldn't associate it with myself. This led me to be in denial for a year after I was raped. I don't know how I could be in denial when the morning after my rape, I woke up feeling so physically and emotionally disgusted with myself that I had to take a long shower. When I got to the shower is where I found the, d the deep, swollen bruises over my body, and I cried and I threw up, and I scrubbed my body with so much soap and water because I didn't know what else to do. I covered my bruises with makeup and wore sweaters and tried to hide as much of my skin as I could because I felt embarrassed and I was full of shame and I blamed myself for getting raped. During the days following my rape, I would be sitting in a classroom, or at work, or with friends, and I just want to reach out and show them my bruises. But I was still petrified that no one would believe me, and I was still full of sh this shame, and I felt alone. And so I acted, or I kept silent, and then I spiraled into this chronic depression and acted as if my first year of college had went perfectly. My mind, however, tried to protect itself with this shield of denial. But I was diagnosed with anxiety, severe depression, and PTSD because of my rape. I've learned to expect a trigger at any time, any place, with anyone. I've been triggered while listening to the radio in the car, when a certain phrase is said, or when the topic of rape comes up unexpectedly. 
Every person who has experienced trauma has different triggers. It could be a phrase, a smell, clothing, noises, music, anything that would trigger the memory of a trauma. That's what it's like to live with PTSD. I understand the traumatic impact of rape from multiple perspectives. I've been the person who eventually shared my story about being raped, and I've also been the person to listen to others' survivors' stories about their rape. Before I was raped, I was an open book, and I let everyone know what was going on with my life. After I was raped, I held on to this dark secret about myself. As I've grown older, I've realized that my rape has affected me so much that it's affected all of my relationships. And relationships are already a very difficult thing to maintain for everyone, but especially for a rape survivor. And relationships can be anything. It could be a friend, a family, a coworker, and it could be a relationship with anybody. I have a really tough time being around people, being in any romantic relationships with people, being in public for long periods of time. My social anxiety and my overwhelming fear of being touched have only grown worse in the last few years. I've become an expert at knowing my surroundings and adjusting my behaviors because of these paranoid feelings. I used to love giving and receiving hugs, and now I prefer not hugging anybody at all except certain family and friends. And some days I have bad days where I can't hug anyone at all. I can't even touch someone that has been close to me and that I've known forever because of the disgust. It's terrifying not being able to know why your mind and body feel so foreign to, to me. However, I have this amazing counselor that has helped me find the language to describe these feelings and these emotions. But some days I still find it difficult to leave my apartment. There are only a few supportive friends that I have in my circle. Friends that truly get me and understand how I, have had, how I have had to survive because of my rape. When I have to cancel plans with friends, they understand why and are empathetic. I have a deep understanding and deeper relationships with people who have also gone through trauma and who live with the mental illnesses that come from trauma because of the understanding. I've learned a lot from these people. A lot, I've learned a lot from my friends that have also gone through trauma. I've learned that everyone has their own coping mechanisms and their own survival strategies, but we have to respect that as long as it's helpful and healing. I am trying to learn how to work through this trauma instead of having it constantly torment me all the time. Imagine telling someone you think you trust about your traumatic experience. And then instead of offering unconditional love and support, they blame you. Or say something so hurtful that you don't know who you can trust anymore. I have had people say some terrible things to me regarding my rape, saying that it was my fault or that I shouldn't have been drinking that night When a rape survivor is told that something as traumatic as their rape is their fault by someone that they love and trust, this can make the survivor go back into denial and go back into self-blame. So please be compassionate and respectful to a survivor that comes to you for support about their rape. 
A trauma has a daily impact on a survivor's life. And many of us do not know how to handle it because of the self-denial and the blame. A person cannot simply get over it. I've been told to get over my rape, my trauma, and living with m multiple uh, mental and physical disabilities. It's just important to listen and to let the survivor know that you are there for them and that you believe them. Help them get through this instead of telling them to get over it. Self-care is a vital part of the healing process for a rape survivor. Self-care can be broken down into two categories, emotional self-care and physical self-care. Emotional self-care in this case would be to seek out professional help and to see a counselor as long as it's needed. The other types of emotional self-care that I rely on are meditation, yoga, and writing. The physical self-care in this case would be to check in with your body and make sure that you are getting enough sleep, exercise, drinking enough water, and eating enough nutritious food. These self-care tacti tactics are highly important in the healing process for a rape survivor. So how would you respond to someone that has just told you that they had been raped? If a survivor comes to you and tells you that they have been raped, the first step is to believe them. Never ask any questions about what happened. Only ask questions about what you can do to help them. Sympathy and empathy are your two closest friends. And consent of every kind of touch is vital. A survivor's body has just been violated. Ask before you even hug. You should always suggest professional help, but sometimes survivors have a rough time reaching out. So just give them time and keep encouraging them to seek out professional help. Because there's nothing about therapy to be ashamed of. Survivors who are suffering in this way have different needs at different times. Sometimes a survivor might need space. Other times a survivor might need a distraction. Sometimes survivors don't know what they need. So you just need to respect their space. Remember that a rape survivor has just opened up to you opened up a vulnerable part of their being to you, and you need to respect that. Talking about this topic is not easy for anybody. I remember having a very rough time talking to my counselor about my rape for the first time. It is up to the person who went through the trauma to choose who they get to tell. If they tell you, it means they trust you. So how will you be there for someone you love that has been raped? Will you be able to help them? Know that bearing witness to their trauma and offering unconditional support might help them go on even when they think that they can't. This month marks the fourth year anniversary of my rape. April used to be a time of deep sadness and rage for me. Now that I've given this talk, there's the possibility of April being a time of overpowering or of, of empowerment and overcoming. 
Thank you.